This segment that we're going to get into is additionally a getting started component. We're going to talk about some basic fundamentals that we need to understand about mechanical advantage and the basic physics behind mechanical advantage. Much like anchor theory, we're utilizing some applications or theologies that have to do with force in and force out. We need to remember some basic rules of thumb when learning how to calculate mechanical advantage. The first rule of that is that whatever comes into a pulley must come out of a pulley. So if I have a 300 pound load and 300 pounds of that load is attached to a rope going into that pulley, then there must be 300 pounds coming out of that pulley. As I add additional ropes, additional segments, and additional appliances, i.e. moving pulleys, all those factors start to change a little bit. When we calculate mechanical advantage, we're going to calculate it using a concept called units of tension. When we count units of tension, we're all, always going to start counting them from the pull or from the position of the hand that is on the rope system. So we're going to use a simple three to one mechanical advantage. I shouldn't say simple, a simplistic three to one mechanical advantage or Z-ray component to start analyzing this theory. In that three to one application, at the pull, I'm going to always start with one unit of tension. That one unit of tension is going to travel through that rope system until it either contacts a prusik that is coming out of a moving pulley or until it contacts the load. In either of those applications, those are the areas where we're going to add those units of tension, resulting in a sum or a higher component, which is going to start generating mechanical advantage force. The other application where we'll do some adding or some summation is where we have kill points or knots that are moving within the system. So in general with mechanical advantage systems, we're always going to have an anchor and we're always going to have a load. For all of our applications in this theoretical consideration component, we're going to give that load a coefficient of 300 pounds. Remember that based on our NFPA references and all the equipment that is designed for rope rescue, they're built around contemplating, in theory, one person and two person design loads, i.e. just a rescuer or a rescuer and a victim if we're tending that victim. That 300 pound coefficient applies to that, co that loose or theoretical coefficient for a single rescuer. A 600 pound coefficient is utilized for a rescuer and a victim. Although those are how the equipment is engineered or designed to support loads and a lot of the theory that we utilize in rope, it's important to denote that as we increase in experience and assessment capabilities on uh, our rope evolutions or on rope rescue scenarios, we can accurately analyze our loads um, with a little bit more detail and generate more accurate considerations as far as where we're going to rig in that G-rated design gear or that L-rated design gear to accommodate the load and the forces that we're applying to the system. Once again, for an example, if we're, if we're rescuing a very small uh, victim, a teenager, a child, someone that we know is less than 100 pounds, uh, and then additionally if our rescuer is a petite person, perhaps weighing 140 or 150 pounds, we could theoretically analyze both of those components as a 300 pound design load or a light design load even though it's a rescuer and a victim or a two person load. So just remember to approach all of these theories and concepts with some common sense applications and just make sure that you're always making edu educated and informed decisions about how you apply the information and the fundamentals that we're discussing. So back to our mechanical advantage component. We've got that 300 pound load and we've got our anchor system up here. If we're rigging in that 3 to 1 Z drag, <clears throat> then we're going to have a rope that's coming down to the load and is killed at the load with a knot. That rope is going to progress through a directional pulley. So this is nothing more than a change of direction pulley. It doesn't move and it doesn't progress in any fashion. Because it does not move or progress and is fixed at the anchor, it carries no mechanical advantage. That rope comes out of that pulley and in a three to one Z drag, we're gonna put another pulley on that rope 
and attach that pulley to that primary line with a prusik or with paired prusiks, or I should say tandem prusiks. That rope will come out of that pulley, and here is our hauling or pulling point. So this is where our hand is located at. This is where we're going to start with contemplating that one unit of tension. So if I have one unit of tension right here at the pull, then I'm going to have one unit of tension coming into the pulley. What comes into a pulley must come out of a pulley, resulting in one unit of tension coming out of the pulley. So I have one in and one out. This pulley moves and is not fixed at the anchor point. So at this pulley, I'm going to add these two units of tension, resulting in two units of tension at the prusik. What comes into a pulley must come out of a pulley, and here's the second point to that statement, it stays the same as it progresses through the system until it contacts one of those three elements I dis discussed earlier or identified earlier as mechanical advantage components. A knot that moves, a pulley that moves, or a prusik that moves. So one unit comes in, one unit comes out, it stays the same, progresses through the system resulting in one unit of tension going through the change of direction, one unit of tension coming out of the change of direction, staying the same, no mechanical advantage calculation, and then that one unit of tension comes down and meets that prusik where those two units of tension are. This results in three units of tension coming out of that system beyond that point, giving us our three to one mechanical advantage. Once we've derived what the mechanical advantage is in theory or theoretical mechanical advantage, we're then going to also contemplate or understand what else that equates to for us. So theoretically, if this is a 300 pound load and I've applied a 3 to 1 mechanical advantage to it, that 3 to 1 ratio tells me several things. Number one, the amount of force that is required to move that 300 pound load is a 3 to 1 relationship. So the 3 represents 300, the 1 would represent 100 pounds of theoretical force is required to move this 300 pound load. That's the first thing that that mechanical advantage relationship or ratio tells me. The second thing that that ratio or relationship tells me is that for every 3 feet of pull, it's only going to generate 1 foot of rise. This is a really important theology, I think, in determining what type of mechanical advantage systems we develop. We always want to allow the victim or the, or the rescuee to drive the rescue. So we want to analyze their injuries, analyze the critical nature of the event, and then incorporate all that into an overall safety perspective and a risk-benefit analysis and try to generate, in my opinion, the smallest, safest mechanical advantage system to, add, to haul that load up to the top side. We want to use the small system because of that last component that I just discussed, which is for every three feet of pull, we have one foot of rise. If we jump right to a nine to one hauling system, then it's going to require nine feet of haul to generate one foot of rise. Although that may be a relatively easy system to operate because we have so dramatically reduced the amount of force required to move the load, it is not an efficient system because of all of the resets that are required as well as all that length of rope that's required to get very minimal reaction. So always try to, pr to produce, develop, or construct efficient systems that are uh, adequately, have an adequate mechanical advantage for three, uh, three haulers with one in transition to haul that system. There's another concept that drives how many haulers we put online, and it's called the 12 rule. Um, the 12 rule basically says take this mechanical advantage component, divide it into 12, and that's going to tell you how many um, haulers you can put on that system without overloading the system. It has some lim limited applications when we get into higher mechanical advantages, five, sixes, and nines. Um, and for a lot of two-person load applications, or I should say G-rated type load applications of 600 pounds, uh, we're going to be utilizing sixes, complex sevens, um, or nines. Those types of applications, we're typically just going to stay as a general rule of thumb with that three-haul team, member, three team members 
with a fourth in transition. In all of our applications that we've done in the field, utilizing a three-man haul team with a fourth in application and dynamometers with lots of consistency, we've never overloaded a system or seen loads um, or forces generated within that haul team where they can't detect or feel encumbrances or changes in the system and quickly stop and analyze what's occurring. So just keep all that in, in mind in relationship to that mechanical advantage theory. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about is types of mechanical advantage systems. There are three basic types of mechanical advantage systems. There are simple mechanical advantage systems, compound mechanical advantage systems, and complex mechanical advantage systems. There are three very distinct differences between these systems. A simple system is basically a system uh, that plays out lots of rope, has no process or progress capture devices in it, and all your pulleys are either fixed or all of them collectively moving towards the anchor, moving in the direction of haul with the load. So an example of a, of a sim simple system that everyone should be relatively familiar with is a block and tackle or a 4 to 1 slash 5 to 1 depending on how it's integrated. In these systems, we typically only see them in confined space applications or some low angle applications because what we're doing in theory is creating a fixed pulley at the anchor point, which is our change in direction, and then we're running rope down to the load, putting pulleys potentially at the load, running this back up, and we'll say that these are double pulleys, retracing it through that pulley, coming back to that pulley, retracing it through that pulley, and then redirecting it um, either through a becket on this end or a becket on this end. It'll be killed with a knot at one point and then a point coming out depending on how we generate it as a 5 to 1 or a 4 to 1. Again, we would start at the pool, we would count our units of tension progressing through this system, and the only place we would do summation or math is at the load, analyzing each of those units of tension coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out, and then generating what that mechanical advantage application is. The reason we only see these simple type of systems um, in limited applications is because the number of ropes as well as appliances that would potentially be going over the edge. In confined space applications, more times than not, when we're implementing high angle type of components, we're utilizing a tripod so this system is freestanding uh, directly under the tripod. It's not directing laterally, contacting an edge, and then progressing over the edge. You can imagine if all these ropes were contacting an edge surface, that generates a tremendous amount of friction, taking that theoretical mechanical advantage that we're applying and making it very, very highly theoretical because now we're generating so much friction that our actual mechanical advantage isn't going to be anywhere near what we've actually constructed making the system not very efficient and not very effective for applications where we're encountering an edge. The other downside of this system is it utilizes a tremendous amount of rope. So if this were a 25 foot descent, you could see that each leg of the ropes going in and out of these types of systems would have to be 25 feet in length. So even though we've only got a 25 descent, we're potentially gobbling up 100 feet of rope to 125 feet of rope just within this application of the descent zone. So, limited applications. One predominant place where we really like to use simple systems is in piggyback applications for not passing or quick fixes for short hauls in mid-height pa patient packaging applications, certain specialized components like that. In those applications, having them pre-built, condensed, um, and integrated progress capture device type of systems make them very, very effective. But that kind of sums up simple systems.